began in healthy looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care, many died. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. We could be looking at double the number of cases in one week and 16 times as many in a month if we are not able to stop the spread. That would be on the order of half a million cases and it would continue to rise exponentially. In three months, we could be approaching 10 million cases. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together. We have known about caps-like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. And sure, there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. So the policy crisis in question for this board in this meeting is this. How should governments, business, and international organizations allocate and distribute pandemic antivirals and medical supplies to the people who need the most? What we've seen work uh, very well in the HIV field is, in fact, procurement through the Global Fund. So having a centralized mechanism, so financial, financially able to procure on behalf of affected countries okay. would be critical. I think the second thing, the second thing is um, it's going to be very important that for the business sector, for manufacturers of anti antivirals, that we have clarity around what the need is and where the need is and who are making the decisions. I think that given that uh, the countries most affected are those that are low and middle income countries with unequal access to technology, to, to finances, uh, the UN has a, a worldwide uh, footprint, universally uh, recognized and uh, universal membership. A global stockpile would certainly help ensure more rational and strategic allocation, but the reality is that we don't have the logistics capability, even within the UN, to bring that together in one place and run it. So this is where I think a collaboration between the international organizations like the World Health Organization and the private sector, which runs these supply chains for many purposes every day, understand where the supplies are, make smart decisions about how to allocate them to the people who need them in the places that need them the most, and then work with the industry to move those supplies from where they are today to where they need to be. Just to underscore the point that cooperation among supply chain providers or businesses that have huge supply chains mm -hmm. can add a lot of efficiency to the whole process. The question is, can you, through this international mechanism, really promote commitments to doing this as quickly as possible and give people a sense that actually if they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance of protecting their own populations and their country's security and health. So to be completely clear, most uh, of this production would already be committed in contracts. Yes. Uh, it is almost unheard of that people are producing product without having a forward commitment for the consumption of that product. So the first thing that needs to be done, because this is not something that the countries currently control, unless countries are going to bring about emergency situations and co-opt an existing supply chain. I think it's not likely, I agree, that, that countries are not going to buy, uh, buy a countermeasure to put into a global supply without retaining a large portion of it for themselves. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. 
Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. How should national leaders, businesses and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans? If there's some sense that there's a UN institution that can do all of this, mm -hmm. then I, I, I worry we're suffering from a delusional disorder mm -hmm. on the power of the UN. Uh, it's really important to get those industries and their trade associations and a, an efficient leadership established, which is decentralized, uh, but has a collective responsibility and accountability. And that mm -hmm. needs to be supported by um, the public uh, leadership. What is essential, what is non-essential travel, we have to clarify this. Otherwise, if we go down to 20% bookings over a long period, the company will run down. That's a fact. Yeah, there's a whole complex set of issues in a highly interdependent world on supply chains that are just in time. We need to think about how much flex there is in that just-in-time supply chain system and make sure it keeps running. I think it's going to take specificity, and it's going to take knowledge that only the private sector has. The UN can play an important coordinating facilitation role, but the companies know where those commodities are, where they move, how to move them, and that's where a, a, a type of public-private collaboration that we have not generally had in these crises needs to be put together pretty quickly. We are not out of money yet, but the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. So the policy question for this board now is how should financial resources be prioritized? Are there nodes that we cannot allow to fail? What is your sense of priorities? We don't have money to pay for all of these urgent problems. So at the moment, we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? So government kind of supplies our money. A lot of you know, private sectors, you know, some are sitting here, you have some money. But now you need a really coordinated centralized efforts. Hotels will be, will be experiencing, you know, crippling losses during that. And we know that the hotel business in itself makes up 5% of the GDP. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or, for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. We shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. We need to escalate that, whether it's through you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan mm -hmm. that can go into effect uh, can stimulate uh, change very quickly. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis- and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? And what if that false information is coming from companies or from governments? I think it's very important that we make sure that there is concise communication with all healthcare facilities where these patients are being treated so that there isn't mass panic. We're at a moment where the social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities mm -hmm. to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information. Because to, try to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. One thing we haven't spoken about, and I'm wondering whether it's time to talk about this, is uh, a step up from the part of the governments on enforcement actions against fake news. I personally do not believe that trying to shut things down in terms of information is either practical or desirable. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. But we also need to actually think about a technological answer to this. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in Event 201 was catastrophic. 
65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. The global economy was in a free fall. The GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing. Banks were not lending. Everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to 10 years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we, as a global community, now finally ready to do the hard work needed to prepare for the next pandemic?